It is really beautiful to see so many people out to celebrate the screening of The Tube of Thieves by Alison O'Daniel. Yes. Big round of applause. Yes. Uh, this screening is part of the, the Mocha film series um, and is presented with the support of the Edward F. Uh, Lamato Foundation. This is an ongoing series of screenings followed by uh, conversations with the artist and their chosen conversationalist. I would like to take this moment to thank Clara Kim, who uh, is our chief curator who organized this series, but sadly could not be here this evening. Uh, my wonderful colleague, Brian Dang, who is somewhere, who makes it all happen. Um, Christina and Audrey, who are in the booth. Uh, uh, and then also, of course, uh, Cass uh, Del Casillo, who is going to be doing the ASL interpretation this evening. Thank you so much, Cass. Lastly, I want to thank Alison and, and Charles Gaines, who have joined us this evening to be in conversation about the film. I'm going to take this opportunity to read their short bios uh, before their conversation begins. Alison O'Daniel is a deaf artist and filmmaker who builds a visual, oral, and haptic vocabulary that reveals, or proposes, a politics of sound that exceeds the auditory. O'Daniel's film, The Tuba Thieves, premiered at the 2023 Sundance Film Festival and is currently on the film festival circuit. O'Daniel is a United States Artist 2022 Disability Futures Fellow and a 2022 Guggenheim Fellow in Film and Video. She is represented by Commonwealth and Council in Los Angeles and is an Assistant Professor of Film at California College of the Arts in San Francisco. A pivotal figure in the field of conceptual art, Charles Gaines engages formulas and systems in his work that interrogate relationships between the objective and the subjective realms. Using a generative approach to create series of works in a variety of mediums, he has built a bridge between the early conceptual artists of the 1960s and 1970s and subsequent generations of artists pushing the limits of conceptualism today. He is also a great drummer, as you may have noticed. Um, <laughs> And with that, over to Alison and Charles. Thank you so much. Hello. Yes, okay. I'm uh, really honored to have this opportunity to talk to you about the film. And, uh, and this is the second time I've seen it. And I can safely say that this is a film that can be seen dozens of times because the experience not only deepens but changes, and that probably is because, in part, uh, of the kind of... Uh, uh, unique structure, uh, linear structure that you, you use that where you just sort of just take us on a walk through different scenarios to experience different sounds. Mm -hmm. And that walk changes each time the film is seen. And so I was so uh, moved by the fact that, you know, because I didn't know that was going to happen, uh, moved by the fact that it was a much deeper, as deep as the experience was that on my first showing or viewing. Mm -hmm. It was even deeper this time. That's awesome. Uh, I'm yeah. happy to, <laughs> really happy to hear that. Uh, the, uh, the, actually, the first question I wanted to ask you, um, you know, since uh, you're, you're, I know, I've known you as a visual artist and, uh, and we've known each other for you know, quite a while now, but I also know that uh, this film was started around the time that we first got to know each other. Yeah, yeah, maybe. yeah, I think was, so. quite yeah. a long time ago, and uh, so I was wondering, um, you know, how you, this got developed. I mean, how, in, in what way can you explain the slow evolution of this film, and, and particularly how the structure itself is a product of that slow evolution? Yeah, I, I mean, I really like slow burn projects in general. Um, maybe I just like slow burn kind of things. Um, and I, well, I, so I made a film when I was at, when I was graduating from UC Irvine, um, and I made that film with a cast and crew that was split across, um, like half of the cast and crew were deaf and half of the cast and crew were hearing or deaf and hard of hearing and hearing. And, um, and I was really just kind of amazed by how different everybody's experience with sound and with hearing was. And in that 
um, like in that moment when I was really amazed, I heard a story about the tubas being stolen from Centennial High School, um, which Manuel Castaneda, the band director at Centennial High School, is here in the front. Um, and <laughs> and um, yeah, so I think like, uh, Centennial was the second high school. Jordan was first, and Centennial, you were the second, I think, or maybe, I don't know, there were like a, a handful of schools that were having their tubas stolen, but I heard a story about Centennial having their tubas stolen, and I think like maybe anyone else in LA who heard that story, I just was like, what? This is such a weird story. But then I heard the story again about a week later from a different high school, and then I heard it again from a different high school um, like a month later. And it was at that moment that I started to really realize that there was this way that the story was being reported that was really focused on the thieves. And I wanted to know so much more. Like I wanted to know about what the experience was like in the classroom. I wanted to know what the tuba players were doing. Like, were they just sitting there in class? Um, and then I started taking notes and wrote down, like I was trying to find band directors' names, getting in touch with people. Manuel was like just totally willing to open the doors to me and I went and met him. And I remember um, not Giovanni, but the other drum major that you had, whose name I, I'm blanking on right now, but I remember he made a joke about how they just switched to trombone and was kind of like, meh. And, um, <laughs> and I was so charmed by talking to the students about it, talking to you about it, and I realized that, you know, there was this, um, this thing I wanted to do, but I had no idea what it was. And so I, I decided it was gonna be called The Tuba Thieves, and then I decided after that that I wanted to make a film backwards and start with musical scores. And so then I commissioned three um, musicians, so Steve, Ro Steve Roden. I mean, also, like, what's interesting about um, your role in this film and Steve's role as one of the um, one of the composers of the film was really and Christine Sun Kim was um, that I was interested also in like artists working with sound and working with music and so um, so I commissioned um, the two of them Christine and Steve and then Ethan Frederick Green who had made the score for my previous film to make me musical scores they didn't have anything to respond to because obviously I wasn't giving them a finished film for them to make a score like uh, I think a more normal film making route and so I gave them these really random things that were just that I had pinned around my studio um, but also uh, news stories about the tuba thefts and so anyway long story short I, I they Get, responded to these really random things that I gave them, made me musical scores. And then I started writing this screenplay. Um, and then around that time, I was also really starting to think about like, what, or starting to ask these questions um, about like, what does it mean to listen? And what does it mean to listen if I could untether that from the ears? Um, and so I was, you know, I don't know what the answer to that question is. I still don't necessarily, well, I guess this film is the answer to that question. Um, and so I just went down this kind of long path of sort of becoming a sponge where all these sort of anecdotal things became what was in the film. So Nike had a small role in my first film and then I was hanging out with her and she told me that she had in her 20s dated a really famous musician and went on tour with him and his drummer would set up a drum kit um, would set up two drum kits and she would just mirror his movements. And so she had had this relationship to drumming and I was like, oh, when she told me that I was like, would you like to be the main character of this film that I'm making that I don't really know what it is yet? <laughs> and she said yes. And um, I think Manuel, I sort of said something similar. Like I, I it, so basically what the film is, is it's a lot of people who said yes to me. <laughs> All the people who said no are not in it, obviously. <laughs> And uh, you said yes to me. And it was funny because we were talking about this conversation. And I was like, do you know why you're in this film? And, um, and so, yeah, so it is, it in a way, it's kind of like a record of people who were like, okay, this is fun or interesting or something. And so slowly, I think the answer to this, like, what does it mean to listen untethered from the ears was um, like, how, how does information kind of build on itself and how does narrative bubble up, like rather than starting with an idea, like could, could narrative kind of come as the film is developing? 
So it's a long answer, but. Um. Uh, yeah, uh, you uh, almost finished all my questions. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, incidentally, I want to remind you that, that you know, we'll sp speak for a few minutes and then we want to open the up for uh, questions from you, for about 15 minutes of questions from you. Uh, and it, uh, what, you, what you said, uh, what you were talking about, and it's particularly about how you were uh, bringing in subjects and characters and so forth, uh, there, there's sort of a, a number of s s small themes that are montaged or collage linearly together. And, but you, you, you have no, there's no doubt that there's some really emot emotive content in those themes. And so can you go, go about how that developed? I mean, how did, you, how did you decide to build these characters and build these themes? So what was happening? Like, for example, the, there's several love stories, I would call them. Yeah. So uh, how uh, did you decide, how did they build up, especially considering the fact that you were emphasizing the issue of sound? Yeah, well, um... The, it's interesting because Giovanni and Asia, uh, so Giovanni is not, was not, unfortunately not able to be here tonight, he had to work, but um, he was the drum major um, at Centennial and we did a collaborative project. We were invited by Joan Gallery to do a collaboration at ALAC. And so I had already filmed, which is the Art Los Angeles Contemporary um, Art Fair, in 2016, and the film was already like underway. Um, and, and so we had already filmed together a few times, I think three times, Centennial High School Marching Band and myself. And then, um, and then we started to develop this performance together. So this film has all these kind of like legs that, and arms that go in like, have gone off in gallery shows and performances. And, and I think it was at that moment where working with the band, I remember I wrote Giovanni's name on the, on the whiteboard behind myself and I spelled his name wrong. And at a certain point he walked behind me and he was like fixing it and Manuel, I remember like yelled at him to sit down. And, um, <laughs> and I just like, it was at that moment where I was like, oh my God, I love Giovanni so much. And, and, um, and then when we were doing the performance, I remember it was like the, the band moving through ALAC um, and Manuel and I kind of like on the sides, sort of directing them a little bit. And at one point I walked up to Giovanni and I was like, what are you feeling? And he was like, it needs to be really loud. And I was like, okay, go for it. And at that moment I was like, I think you should be the other main character in this film. And so I asked him, you know, if, if if you're going to be in this film, would you be open to talking to me about what your experience was like, you know, in the last two years of high school? Um, and so I had already filmed with him when he was like 14 and 15 in the band, but then when he really became a character, he had graduated at that point, or I, I think he actually didn't graduate. Is that right? Yeah. And, um, and so that was actually part of it. So the part where he gets kicked out of his house, that, that you don't need to know this in the in the film, but it's not his girlfriend's house. I think some people think he's getting kicked out of Asia's house, but he's getting kicked out of his real home um, by his adopted parents. And so he was, he was really generous and, and we really worked together to develop his story. And then, um, and then there were, and, and so Nike and I, we were working with Nike's story in a slightly more fictional way, like the relationship with her and Nature Boy and RC. Nature Boy and RC are totally fictional characters. Um, they're based on real people, but, um, so it was interesting to do these like parallel stories, um, but one really working through fiction and one really working through nonfiction. And I liked the way that they could, um, you know, just exist in the same world. And, you know, I, th I think in, in cinema, there's this need for things to feel like they're gonna connect. And, um, and I think at a certain point, I really realized that the film was, um, yes, it has love in it, but it also, I, it took me a while to understand I was making a film about grief. Um, and so the tubas being stolen or this idea of hearing loss versus deaf gain, um, and deaf gain being a term and the deaf community that is like, actually our culture is really rich um, and we have a lot, but I was raised totally in like a hearing family and hearing schools. And so I really like had this idea of hearing loss kind of 
you know, put to me my whole life. And so I think once I, I, at a certain point, I made this connection that like, oh, these tuba thefts and this like loss of this like deep sound, there was something there that was really um, resonant for me around like how to grapple with loss and like even giving the school and the, the marquees of the schools kind of these like voices about like loss and grief. Um, it felt like um, nice to have this parallel of like love and the gain within these relationships that were really tender and um, and not rooted in a kind of like normal like cinematic drama and conflict. Uh, that was such a long meandering answer. I don't even know. Yeah, no, great. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's uh, one of the things that I've discovered is what it uh, sounds like to get kicked out of your house. So, and uh, yeah. what what love sounds like, you know. I mean, the, the, the narrative uh, uses sound as a, as a uh, as an instrument, uh, as a kind of a facilitating instrument to bring. Wait, getting kicked out of your house is the instrument of love? What? Two different subjects. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so the way I'm thinking about it is that as you talk about these, these subjects. Uh, these subjects are brought into being through sound uh, as well as vision, but we pay less attention. To, we take the sound more for granted than we take the vision, and, and, and this gives us the opportunity to, to, re, to, to realize how important sound is and that experiences are accompanied by sounds, and we can identify them that way. Yeah, well, I mean, it gives hearing people that opportunity. Yeah. I think deaf audiences are taking away a very different thing because that's already, you know, that's already like, de I, I think, I mean, I, I have noticed this this really interesting difference is that um, in in the reception of the film by hearing audiences or deaf audiences and that conversation of like noticing sound is something that I think is so remarkable in deaf culture because we just like, we're, we constantly notice sound. We're constantly in conversation with sound. We're thinking about sound all the time. So I think it's like, um, whereas hearing audiences, I think, are so used to sound that maybe, I mean, I'm, I don't know. I don't want to speak for everybody. But it's, it's something I notice a lot. And it's... Um, yeah, I mean, this, this uh, reminds me of what we were talking about because I thought that one of the things that you contributed in this film is a, is a different theory of, of uh, film narrative. Uh, s uh, simply because uh, uh, because of the focus on sound, that you, you brought up a, a term in our discussion, soundscape. And so I see that term as uh, you know, sort of a moving through space and time, and in terms of a series of spaces. But in this case, there's soundscapes, and 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 that becomes a critical alternative to the typical notion of the film narrative. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I'm, well, and also I think, so a backstory for all of you is that when I, when I write captions, I'm really, really bad at writing captions for music. I just like, I really hit kind of a wall and it's, it, I, I just don't know what to say or how to describe music. So what I was doing with all the musicians who were in the film, so Patrick Shiroishi and Charles, I reached out to both of you and I was, asked, I was interviewing you both about the music you performed because I felt like the best way to caption your music would be to use your own words. And so there's something that makes me laugh about this scene that you're in because in some ways it's like, the, it's one of the more almost like normal, normative like, narrative scenes um, and yet one of the things that we talked about which didn't end up in the captions for your scene but one of the one of the things that we really discussed that I was really curious about how you make music and you and remind tell me if I'm getting this right but what I remember you saying was about like when when you're playing you're listening for for rhythm and pattern and always kind of um, always trying to not get caught in a pattern, is that right? Like always trying to to let the pattern keep sort of moving and shifting and guiding you in a different direction. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. That, I mean, it says something like that. And, and, it, and it reminds me that, you know, in, in dealing with the, the this idea that I have that we're watching visually uh, 
uh, the consequences of the production of sound that that becomes an organizing structure in in, in uh, watching you know time in a, in a cinema that it's, it's like a drum solo in the, in in the sense that you evolve with patterns and you're not willing wanting to repeat patterns but you're wanting to build patterns on top of patterns on top of patterns so you're in a real time situation so if a film narrative typical film narrative requires a, a kind of a linear history of time. But uh, what I found interesting, and I think this is so good about your film and that why you can see it over and over again, because these patterns keep changing, the visual patterns uh, uh, keep changing. Yeah. yeah, and one of the things that was really uh, meaningful to me was that, so when I interviewed Patrick about his music, I did use some of his words in the captions. And so I, like when I write captions, I actually don't like to write emotions like I don't I don't like captions that say sad something or other or because I want to let the audience have the agency to sort of like interpret and feel and hear or read and then develop their own emotional relationship to what they're seeing but Patrick had the music he was performing was about um, his grandparents having been in internment camps in Los Angeles and so he was using these words like vulnerable and melancholy and and those, I in nowhere else in the film does it have those kind of that kind of emotional language, um, but in his music, I felt like it really made sense to actually include those words in the captioning of his of his music, and then with yours, I actually then didn't use what you had said in the captions of your music, but then I used what you had said in the editing of the film. So in, in many parts of the editing. So the way you had described um, that you were always sort of, sort of like in this kind of, or at least the way, that one of the things that I took away from it was this feeling like um, you're listening and then also responding and changing. So like your relationship to time, to what you're listening to in the present is being followed up by this thing that then is like not going to keep moving in an expected way, I guess. And so that was one of the things that came into the sort of overall edit from for the, the Tuba Thieves, which was then using like Charles's um, sort of philosophy, I guess, or theory of how you perform, how you're listening. And then I was trying to use that as like an edit. I don't, is this, I'm sorry if this is so like. No, I like, actually, I, I, I take full responsibility for having this immense influence on your pro product. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can have it. Yeah, the, the one last question, the last question I, I wanted to ask you is, uh, uh, the, the film has been getting great reviews and it's been uh, reviewed for, uh, often. And I want to know, and the attention that it's getting is coming from Sundance. I, I wanted to know uh, your feelings about uh, this response, this amazing response to the film. How do you feel about that? It's amazing. <laughs> um, it's surprising. I mean, I'm still so surprised it's done. Um, <laughs> and that people are, like, responding to it is really... It's weird and it's incredible. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm aware that on many, many levels, I'm, I'm really lucky, like there's this moment that I think I've played my part in, but also like there is this moment where people want to be talking about and thinking about disability. And, for, and a, lot of, a, a lot of the reason for that is because many people have been like kicking hard the door open and so, um, and I've been part of that, and also I'm like the beneficiary of a lot of work that a lot of people have been doing, and so that's a really amazing, incredible moment, and so um, I'm just so beside myself that this, I, I'm still sort of so confused that this film went to Sundance. It's really like, <laughs> like it really does kind of blow my mind, and um, and there were, I mean, some. There were just these really fun things that happened there. Like one, um, there was somebody tweeted about how their taxi driver had kept hearing people talk about the tuba thieves, and he knew he had to see it, and that it wasn't about tubas or thieves. It wasn't about thieves or something. And so, like, yeah, the um, it's amazing. It's amazing. I, I'm. 
beside myself. Also, my phone is ringing in my hearing aid right now, which is a weird technological thing, and I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna ignore it and let it uh, go to message. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's never yeah, happened we, to me before in public. We're gonna turn it over to um, for questions. I, I just want to know that uh, because I'm a hair, I wear a hearing aid too, and that's because I was a drummer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the the. Uh, uh, years of banging the drums, uh, you know, so it affected my hearing, and I didn't even know it uh, and, until the, uh, the, the hearing doctor told me I, that I'd lost high frequency. So they put a hearing on, made on me, and, and, and he, they told me that my response would be this way, but they said that you're going to feel the sound is violent mm. yeah, and, and for a while. Yeah, so. It is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. It's a really interesting. But I wanted to uh, open up uh, to, to, to the audience. Uh, we have any questions out there? Anybody would like to ask a question? Thanks. Um, there's a lot to love about this project, and to, um, I'm just I'm very happy to get to see it here in your hometown for its first public screening after seeing bits and pieces over the years. Um, but surprisingly to me, I think my favorite thing is the captions. Actually, um, maybe because I mean I had a couple thoughts about this, and I'll have a rambling question, and you can have a rambling answer, and maybe we could leave time for more questions and answers if we're lucky. But um, um, they're, in, they're really charming and hilarious and self-conscious at times and meta and performative. And they're also this way, like I've been bothered by captions a lot lately because at my house there's a loud TV going and everyone but me thinks the captions have to be on all the time and they're incredibly didactic. So I was quite moved by the moment of calling out the, um, that one instance of music is very tender. I felt it communicated a lot. I loved the moment when the captions are upside down and the camera's upside down, and this moment when we're told that the sound, and we, includes all of us, the hearing and the non-hearing, that the sound lasts this long as the captions. So they start to perform in these really interesting ways, and I was just imagining you being like, oh, fuck, yeah, I could do this with the captions too. Um, so I guess I just wanted to hear a little bit about how that developed, because I think it's incredibly rich, and it also, I think, in a way that most captions in traditional film can't, um, like really seamlessly and comfortably provides um, extra material that normally I'm like, wait, you can't give that person a name. We don't know their name yet. But in the way that the project kind of marries fact and fiction and narrative and documentary and reconstruction and... Um, it feels perfectly natural to occupy this new space that I haven't seen occupied in that way. Um, and I just want to say one more thing before I turn off the mic, which is for the non-hearing in the audience, at the beginning of your talk, we had the pleasure of listening to a small boy snoring over there, um, which is just an incredibly lovely thing. And you guys maybe couldn't hear it or were just ignoring it, but um, nothing like a snoring sleeping child at an art film. So that's also like good, you know kismet or something um that's cute yeah i also like when i was pouring the water i was like oh this is so loud for everybody right now like because i know you're just i don't know you just listen to that film and um yeah the captioning i mean the uh, so when i first started the tube of thieves i had this goal that i was going to make a film that would not have any captions and you would always see the source of the sound so i was trying to do like subvert captioning um, and I tried that and the first scene I made was the plant scene um, and the score was made by Christine Sun Kim who was deaf and she um, I sent it to her and she just was like so unenthusiastic about it and <laughs> and I was like or she just didn't watch it I don't know like it but I was like, oh, okay, I don't think this is working. I think I might need to caption this. And so then um, at the same time that I had that realization, I was also trying to, to I, I felt like she needed, I don't remember why, but I 
had this idea that I needed her vocal track separately, separate from the rest of the music, and asked her if she had it. She didn't, and then I was like, could you remake it? And she was like, no. I... <laughs> and I was like, I mean, she said, no, I don't really know. You know, I don't even know what I did, so no. And then I was like really persistent and started to listen to her score and then try and recreate all the sounds and like take notes about what was happening. Like, oh, my teeth are open, but my lips are closed. And where's my tongue? And where is the sound happening? Like in my throat and I was writing these notes down and then I was just like, oh, that's what I've always wanted. Like captions are so bad and that is so good. And, um, and it was like this really empowering moment where I was like, right, deaf and hard of hearing people should be writing captions because like we've been studying sound for forever. Like we, Obviously, we should be the ones doing it, and um, and so I just I just gave myself like really deep permission to go wherever. Like, um, but then as I was moving through the like eleven years of making this project, you know, I started to get angrier because it was. I mean, I was already angry because you know, anytime you see something and there's like something censored in captions, that's a real like philosophical what the fuck moment like it's really hard to understand how or why that even exists and what that even implies or means and um, so there's like bad captioning that just like doesn't get things wrong and then there's like this egregious kind of like what's that say about some idea about the deaf community and um, and so yeah, I started to get really much more like direct and really, and, th and then also the stuff was happening to me where once the film was, like once the parts of the film were out and, um, and it was getting written about more, like after Made in LA, actually Made in LA was like a really big turning point. That was actually people from Sundance saw it and then were like, you should start applying to the stuff and a producer came on board and then I started getting funding and that was when I was able to really like finish the feature. And, but also after that moment, I started having people reach out to me asking me for help on captioning. And it was just really fascinating to me where I would be like, well, do you have a budget for that? And they'd be like, no. And I was like, and, um, <laughs> and then, yeah, like I, I was like, you know, this is like a thing. I'm, I'm actually developing it and I'm not the only one. Like it's, um, so I started to get like a lot clearer about it. And I, once like enough people were asking me, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna make a page on my website that says how to caption. I'm just gonna put this out there. And then I started to really come up with like, oh, this, it makes sense that captions should really exist on there for a roughly like in relationship to the amount of time that the sound is on there or sound should be on there in relation to the captions, depending on what, how our value system is gonna change. Um, why not? And yeah, so I just like started to really think through it on kind of a like dream level, an activist level, a, like giving myself what I needed and wanted level, um, which I guess is the same thing as those other two. Thank you both and especially you. <laughs> I'm wondering about humor, because the, there was a lot of humor in there, and you have so many different people in there, um, and humor seems to be based on experience and assumptions. So, for example, something that really resonated with me as a, a parent of a different learner is was the testing, and um, Nature Boy running circles around the testing and like that he's been asked the same questions for and the, the torture of that. So that was very funny to me, but it might not have been that funny to somebody who hasn't experienced that, right? So, um, and, and there were so many different communities and uh, ne like uh, assumptions within those communities, both, you know, um, anyway. So, yeah. So, how did you work with that humor? That's my question. 
Um, well, you know, it, it's really interesting when when there have been um, when I've had I've had a few experiences where I've had um, screenings with more deaf people than hearing people, um, or almost exactly half, and those are really amazing for me because the audiology scene, like the deaf audience, laughs, and it's definitely like a loaded laughter, like it's like a it's like a it's like a therapy, this is really satisfying kind of laughter. Um, <laughs> I've seen some, yep. And uh, yeah, because I didn't realize that all of us were like sitting in those booths, like imagining our revenge. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, like those booths are so, they're so warm, they're like little wombs, uh, but they're so violent and um, and it's always the same words. It's always ice cream, baseball, sidewalk, hot dog. It's like so 4th of July also. Like why, <laughs> why is it also so patriotic? Like what is that about? So um, yeah, so I guess I'm always in there just being like, uh, like rolling my eyes as I'm also feeling like this weird psychological test that's supposed to just be a hearing test, but actually I'm like, does she think I'm lying? Am I making it up? Am I here? Ugh. And so, um, yeah, so I guess maybe, I don't know. And then I think like just within me is like a healthy balance of rage and goofiness. So I think you just feel that in the film, maybe like it's. But also, also like I really love, um, I love, and I feel like so much generosity and I, uh, and honesty. And so I think like I'm trying to be very like honest about what it feels like to hear in my ears. Um, and that's how the film is really made and constructed. Is I mean, you were asking me that question of like, what is the narrative? Like, how, how is this narrative kind of like constructed? And it's really constructed based on how I hear. Like it's, sometimes it's really funny. Sometimes it's um, leads you down weird paths um, that are not <laughs> where, you know, like someone will ask me something and the answer is like not at all the answer to the question they asked. And again, that can be funny, but it can also just lead to really weird, like not beneficial or strange endings and so I was trying to utilize all of that in the making of the film and really think of like narrative possibility as including that rather than um, illustrating that or something. Uh, thank you so much. I love the film so much, and I really want to draw attention to these, uh, which we were all given on the entrance, uh, and I thought this was so amazing. This is the very first time I've ever watched a film with my hands on the balloon, which I, I got a cursory introduction to as being something that's in the hard of hearing community, that you would bring a balloon into a, a theater space, and I just found the experience so visceral and overpowering, and I was like, I want to hold a balloon at every concert and every movie I go to for the rest of my life, because this was like so fantastic and like all-encompassing, and I'm, I'm really curious to hear more about the history of that and the, the purpose of the, of the balloon. Yeah, I mean, I just want to, first of all, do it. <laughs> you, you do you, you take a balloon everywhere. Um, but <laughs> I, I do just want to like, clarify that it's not like deaf people are walking around with balloons like and we're not like you know going to um movie theaters with balloons it's just it 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 comes from this tradition of and I, even calling it tradition i feel like i'm making it into like a bigger thing than it is but uh, you know like in the history of deaf clubs like there are deaf social clubs um in every city i think maybe not um but and there would just be these kind of like impromptu, um, this is all sort of like word of hand, you know, like it's uh, this passing along of, of this idea that people would gather and they would watch movies and so they would, you know, very simply just like hold a balloon as a way to feel the soundtrack. Um, and 
it's uh, in the film that I made in grad school. I did this in theaters, and um, and then when we went to Sundance, I was like, oh, maybe I should do that again. It was like I wasn't even really thinking about it very much, and people have just loved it. And so it's been this really fun way to just talk about a very like um, kind of like small story in deaf history and um, and it's such a pleasure and now people are like oh your film's interactive and I'm like yeah I guess it's uh, and so yeah it's just I just we just keep doing it and I love it and I mean I, I will say that actually like one of the things that's been interesting this is kind of an aside but we you know as I've been going all the, all, to all these festivals I have been having these really frustrating kind of ableist experiences at each of them and um, in different ways and so we just recent I just recently like made this website called heavyair.com heavy-air.com and it's um, it's just like a a resource website that um, we're making balloons with like a QR code that goes to that website um, that just talks about you know what festivals need to be doing to be more accessible what filmmakers can do to be more accessible and it's like a very scalable website so at some point when we get to like the streaming stage I'm sure I'm probably gonna add like streamers or broadcasters or distributors this is what you can do you know like artists this is what you can do you know so it's just like a very um, like, it, I think it. I think it's been a really amazing way to just introduce people to. You know, this is like such a practical uh, example of the ingenuity of disabled people who just like are going to solve their problems because nobody else will, and then hopefully it will become institutionalized. So it's that kind of thing where it's like it's really frustrating, especially after COVID. Like, I remember I went to see Power of the Dog in a movie theater and I had li literally forgotten that there were not captions in movie theaters and I just immediately was asleep. And I was like, oh, right. That's why I sleep through lectures and movies and stuff. Cause I just like, I check out cause I can't hear them. And so, yeah, it's just been like a very simple thing to just be like in a movie theater, just have open captions. Like don't make us sit with those crappy like things you put in your cup holder that I, many of you probably don't even know what this is. I, I recommend you all go see a movie theater, movie in a movie theater and ask for a um, closed caption device. Go experience that. And then you'll be like, here you guys, you should just get balloons and have open captions. It's so really enlightening. We have enlightening. time for uh, a couple more questions. We uh, have one in the back there. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I was really happy to see Chalino Sanchez in your movie. Uh, he's such a big part of like Mexican culture in South LA, so I just wanted to know how he made his way into your film. Um, yeah, so I was having this experience as I was going around to different high schools um, where I would realize that the LA Times reporter Sam Quinones was like always visiting a school about a week before me. And, um, <laughs> and so I realized in the making of the film that I was like following Sam Quinones's reporting path. And, um, and I started talking to him. Like I, I it started sort of like, um, very different, but sort of like the experience of Giovanni becoming a major character. Like it was like Sam became a character because I was just like, oh, he's everywhere in my process. Like, I mean, not my process, obviously. Like it's the story of these tuba thefts, but um, it seemed like we were the two people who were kind of like doing research about it. And so when I started talking to Sam, he, um, he what had you know all these ideas about why the tubas were being stolen and just like about the history and the kind of like rise of the popularity of banda music and the tuba in Los Angeles specifically and like what LA's role in in this like rise of the tuba was and so Chalino the story of Chalino and of um, uh, Voces del Rancho, like the, the two of them loving Chalino Sanchez, I think was, it was like Sam reporting on the two of them and their like adoration of Chalino Sanchez and then Chalino Sanchez's like, you know, huge presence in not just like 
culturally in LA, but also like East LA. Like I, w I was just really interested in all of these sort of soundscapes of Los Angeles, whether it's like, you know, artist musicians or like the voices of the NPR reporters that all these people are like driving around or, or any like radio personality. But like, I feel like in LA, the relationship of people to voices in their car from the radio is like one of those really strong, dominant kind of, or prominent like soundscapes. And then Chalino Sanchez and his like, influence in so like on of, on so many people and so many musicians and then like even that like Chalino kind of as a possible uh, like starting point of this going down into the schools and the tubas being stolen like that even possibly being maybe like a theory for um, you know this like popularity of Banda music. I, you know, I also, it's so interesting, like, when I get these very pointed questions because I'm so not, like, I'm not a punk enthusiast with, like, the Deaf Club. I'm not, like, I love that song and the music of Chilito Sanchez at this point, but, like, I didn't come into it knowing anything about him. And so it's really interesting to, like, tell these stories specifically from, like, a kind of deaf perspective and really, like, um, let this is sort of how I define what it means to listen untethered from the ears. It's like this following these kind of like narrative paths and sometimes there are other people's paths like it was Sam's path or Edgar and Mariano's path or even like in relation to the high school students and um, and like you know these um, and the loss of the tuba in these high school environments and so that's how. We have one more question out there. Thank you, Allison. This is so great to see you again. And in its finished form, it just works so beautifully. Um, Thank you. I, I was interested in the uh, reenactment of 433 and your decision to have uh, one person leave. Did that come from any research or was that an inspiration that you felt was necessary for it? Because it's so beautiful to have him certainly transformed into someone who's listening to the sounds under his feet. Uh, it was very moving and I was just, if you could talk about it a little bit, that'd be great. Yeah, it, uh, well, so um, when I first invited the three composers to make me musical scores, I gave them these things that were on my studio wall. And one of the, one of, one of the things I gave Steve Roden was um, this picture of the Maverick Concert Hall. And I had, I had this book of um, hippie Woodstock architecture and I liked everything in it and so I wanted to give him a picture from it I gave him a picture of the concert hall and um, he wrote me back like 10 minutes after I emailed it to him and was like you know that's where John Cage premiered 433 right and I had no idea and um, and he was like you have to do something with 433 like you know you're working with lots of deaf people you're hard of hearing like and I was like, no, that's so cheesy. I just like, I can't do that. And, um, but then he, he was like, it was really meaningful. And there was this thing about like this listening, like the serendipity of listening. And, um, and I happened to be in Hudson, New York. Um, maybe two months after we had had this dialogue about it. And I went to visit, and it was the winter. And I remember going in, they opened the space for me, and it's really like a barn, you know, and it's a summer concert hall space, so it's totally locked up in the winter. And I remember going in and just having this real moment of like, wow, mythology is so powerful because the mythology about 433 that has followed this piece for so long is that it's silent, you know, like that it's, that they're not playing any music. And so it's like the word that always gets used is silent. And I kind of had this like really intense realization that that's the same word that gets used with deafness, and both are really wrong. Like, 
if you're in the Maverick Concert Hall, the, just the leaves in all the trees that are surrounding it are so noisy, and the wind is noisy, and so it's, I've never, I had never really heard 433 talked about as the sounds of nature. It was always, I mean, what's so beautiful about 433 is that it's this like transformation of what music is and can be. Um, but it was in the moment when I realized like, oh, this misunderstanding that deafness is an experience of silence and this misunderstanding that 433 is an experience of silence was the moment when I was like, I think I can do something with this. And I was like, and I wrote The Irritated Man. And so that's, his name. Um, yeah. Alice, may I uh, d uh, uh, slightly disagree yeah. that, in, in fact, it, it, the, the point of, 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 of 433 was not that it was silent, that, it was, that there was sound going on, that it was not a, a called music. And, I, the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the environment, well, for example, the, the shuffling of feet because yeah. several people got up and left the performance during 433. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I think that I, I love John Cage, first of all, and mm. I, I love 433. And I, and I do think that it's, yeah, like when, when people perform it, the joy of it, whether it's like, there's so many good YouTube performances of 433 of like a metal band standing there and like, you know, just like not doing anything or like a huge orchestra stand, like standing there and a timer ticking and stuff like that. And so, yes, it's like, it's all the sounds and it's people sitting there and listening, right? And that's, um, and that's what's so beautiful. But, the, but what I became interested in was the mythology and the mythology being this kind of, uh, I, like this idea about it not being music and deafness being not being about sound. And so I think like may, maybe I shouldn't use the word silence, um, but I think there was like a moment for me when, when like to answer why that became part of the film was that it was like I was I justified it being in the film when I realized that there were like these really powerful mythologies and both of them um, or spe specifically the like mythology about deafness being a kind of soundless or, or silent experience was really the thing that I wanted to express my irritation with. And so the irritated man became this like fictional way to kind of connect these two experiences and actually talk about what I think you're bringing up, which is actually the richness that's in them. And like, so it was at once like a reverence for 433 and that performance and John Cage and also a sort of like slight, like, mm, like a, a slight side eye or a slight like eye roll, you know, like it's like, that's also like take away some of the reverence and like have both and I guess. Allison, I, I want to, uh, to take the opportunity to thank you again for a remarkable experience. And, uh, and also, uh, uh, thanks to you, a very entertaining question and answer period. <laughs> thank you.